We've all been upping demand expectations for much of the past 12 to 18 months. That process has kind of stopped and now we're starting to downgrade them slightly, certainly in the short term, which is natural cyclical behavior. But if anything, some of the dynamics are, are driving uh, long-term expectations a bit higher. So generally speaking, we are uh, bullish uh, on uh, base metals, but we'd expect to see a correction continuing to take place between now and the first quarter of uh, next year. The miners actually need to spend uh, just under $80 billion annually on commodities that are required for the decarbonization sectors, so renewable EVs and energy storage, to make sure that we actually have enough metal. So introducing my panel, um, it's a great time to have Colin Hamilton, who's Managing Director of Commodities Research at BMO Capital Markets, Michael Wigmer, Director of Metal Strategies, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, who you might not have seen, seems to be having some issues with his video, and I'll attend to that in a minute once we've gotten started. And then Bernard Dada, Senior Commodities Analyst at Natixis, who's joining us as well. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. So, gentlemen, thanks very much for giving your time today. And Colin, um, perhaps you could get us started. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bear with me while I share my screen here uh, just a second. Uh, I'll present some slides today to you, just as that. Uh, and it's a very interesting year for commodity markets as a whole. And um, what I want to talk you through is just uh, how we got to where we are, some of the dynamics, and then uh, I do want to spend a bit of time talking about some of the longer term thematics. So when we're thinking from a mining investment point of view, some of the things that may be driving policy, may be driving investor expectations over the coming years. To start off with, I mean, we shouldn't forget, this has been a fantastic year for metals and mining industry as a whole. Very strong commodity prices, uh, close to record, or indeed at record in some cases. Even in the, some of those commodities that have been more out of favour, like gold, we will have a record year for nominal pricing. And with that, we've seen strong industry profitability. What's interesting, I'll just look at the left-hand chart there, that's global mining EBITDA. And you can see there, this will be the second strongest year in history after uh, 2011 uh, in the aftermath of the GFC. Now, back then, every mining company had an expansion project. We saw very strong global mining capex. In fact, we had record capex back in 2012. This time around, partly through discipline, partly through the fact that um, boards know they're still being punished by equity markets for taking long duration capex in the balance sheet. Well, even with the recovery in balance sheets, we are not seeing that spent on expansion capex. What we're seeing more of is uh, capex spent on uh, carbon reduction and indeed operational gains. But with that, we are still pushing longer duration projects out of our model. So if we're looking five years out, we're still taking some, uh, some, uh, still taking some projects out there. It's also very rare that you've got a situation where uh, every commodity you cover is making money, is profitable for the industry as a whole. We haven't really had that again since 2011, but we now have it again. Helped by the fact that, I mean, some other commodities like uranium have uh, performed well in recent times. But uh, as we sit today, every commodity is trading above the 90%. And now those cost curves themselves are moving and we'll talk about some of the factors that are driving that over the next couple of slides, but it is a very strong year for metals and mining as a whole. And what I would say is let's not be greedy. It's more about sustaining the high levels of profitability and necessarily driving them uh, even higher. Now, where I think there's been a bit of a misnomer is what's caused that strong pricing. Is it supply constraints? Well, supply tries to react to cycles. It doesn't tend to lead them. Uh, I would also, uh, has it been the energy transition? Well, it's helped, and certainly the emphasis there, that will be a longer term dynamic. But I would say it's been more the old school Chinese fixed asset investment, developed world consumer durables that have helped. And if we look at the demand side here, if we look at these four uh, charts, aluminium, copper, zinc, steel, what I've plotted there is just the 12 month rate of change in terms of demand. We have never seen a demand impulse of the like we've had here. And in many cases, China led, of course, um, coming th through the pandemic first, but then ex-China has really been the surprise. We've seen that surprise to the upside consistently through this year. But now we're at the point where we're starting to see that, that demand impulse naturally waning, partly through credit, but partly also with where China is and its economy at the current time. And I think that's, a, that's an area still always where we think about the longer term dynamics, but in the short term, what happens in China still does matter. 
And what we've seen in China is a deceleration that's probably been faster than Beijing would have liked. And the property sector has been to the core of that. Obviously, we've seen the issues with Evergrande. Um, but you've got what you've got is classic property deleveraging going on at the moment. Developers have seen what's happened. They know what's going on. They know there's going to be a consolidation process coming through. And with that, they are completing buildings to make sure they get paid, but they're not starting anymore. And if you think of it, one of the less understood factors is that the actual cost of building real estate in China is up by about 20% over the past six weeks or so. So what we have here is a situation where developers are they're not on pause, but they're certainly not pushing new projects forward. And if you add to that some of the other areas um, in terms of the key industrial metrics are plotted on the right-hand side there, they're also decelerating. And it does paint a picture of, of a weakening Chinese demand impulse over the coming period. It's getting to the point now where I do think they will have to step in and support the property market a little bit more uh, before year end. But if we look at it, let's look at things at like steel consumption there. Uh, if we've been having this conversation three or four months ago, I said there's no way Chinese steel demand might be down on 2021 20, uh, as a whole on a year-on-year -year basis. Well, we're now heading towards that pretty quickly. China's taken uh, about 200 million tons of steel demand out of its economy from where it was at the peak at the start of the year. That's a US plus a Japan. And this is the challenge in the short term for commodity markets. At the moment, that is definitely weighing on sentiment at the current time from an investor side. Constraints have been there, um, and not just in terms of normally we're talking about commodity supply constraints, but getting material out of Latin America. Well, actually, there's been more uh, wider constraints here around energy and around shipping. And these are almost extraneous to uh, underlying metals and commodity markets themselves. However, they're definitely having an impact. And what you have is a situation where buyers know there's an issue. And if you have the working capital, well, you will go and hold a bit more material in your uh, on your books than you might do otherwise. And you, but someone somewhere is likely to be scrambling. Some container may not have arrived. They'll be jumping into the spot market. And that's why you've seen this risk premium. And that risk premium above cost will persist even in a slowing demand environment through the middle of next year. But it leaves us in a situation now where we are uh, having had a very strong and a surprisingly strong year for things like industrial production and um, a global recovery uh, we're now starting to push some of that demand into next year. Now, the extent to which it comes back depends on uh, how demand copes with the, the inflation impulse that is coming through at, at the present point. But it is interesting, analysts like ourselves, I mean, I, I would say we've all been upping demand expectations for much of the past 12 to 18 months. Uh, that process has kind of stopped, and now we're starting to downgrade them slightly, certainly in the short term, which is natural cyclical behaviour. But if anything, some of the dynamics are, are driving uh, long-term expectations a bit higher. I think one interesting one to think about, and taking the short term into the long term, is, is obviously carbon. Carbon pricing is not something that typically we factor into medium to long-term analysis. It's clearly something we have to start thinking about now. And I do think whether it comes through costs of finance or whether it comes through uh, just the underlying impact on the cost structure itself, uh, that carbon impact could be something that reshapes markets. Let's uh, let's look at that right-hand chart there. This increase in 90 percentile costs at $60 per tonne global carbon price. And you can see there's something like the aluminium market where you've got this clear bifurcation between the low-cost hydro-based smelters and the coal-fired uh, powered uh, coal-fired smelters at the top end, where you can see a big increase in that 90th percentile. And that actually becomes interesting itself. That could halt or reverse the deflationary trend we've had in many of these markets without raw material constraint. I think this is the sort of thing that is reshaping both finance and is reshaping market dynamics. And it clearly ESG is still at the forefront and decarbonization even beyond ESG is at the forefront of investor minds at the moment. I do want to talk about China and how China's uh, thinking about the carbon situation, because of course we have President Xi, who, I mean, this week will be anointed as a, a supreme leader or whoever you may want to call it. Uh, it will be in the President Xi era. And a lot of his philosophy, he has put his backing behind um, peaking carbon emissions this decade and, of course, carbon neutrality by 2060. Now, heavy industry and metals and mining is an important part of that. We think to the traditional China model, it's been in place pretty much my entire career. Raw material imports, uh, high domestic production, have more than enough domestic capacity, and then export some of that product as an inflation hedge. And that does lead to excess carbon being produced domestically and shipping carbon-intensive products to global markets. 
Well, now as we head towards a, a capacity cap in many cases, we are seeing that model shift and we are looking to China offshoring, quite frankly, a lot of their heavy industry wherever possible. It becomes a little bit harder with the People's Bank of China no longer funding overseas uh, coal projects, but we do are looking for China to go and invest in um, one belt, one road countries in metals producing assets that will be Chinese built, Chinese funded, Chinese operated, and shipping semi-finished products to China. So overseas investment will pick up. We'll see flat to lower domestic production in many cases, but this offshoring of carbon is going to be a key part and it may reshape both raw material flows and semi-finished product flows across global metals and mining markets. And that's important because we're looking at a world where self-sufficiency, reshoring, these are the, the trends. And I think uh, what we've learned over the past, even over the past couple of months, is the importance of China in many of these critical metals value chains. Um, what we've taken here is just um, some of the uh, uh, some of the key commodities that are viewed as critical metals, um, depending on your definition. Uh, but you look at some of these. I mean, I think um, the three of us in the call probably never never had to answer as many questions on magnesium in our lives as we've had to over the past month. But if one city in Shaanxi province has a problem, the world has a problem in the global magnesium market. And then we look at things like gallium, where we get uh, 90% from uh, bauxite alumina production in China. And again, that's been cut pretty severely. So we've seen gallium prices hit a new high this week. And that importance of China is now being noticed and we are looking to see more government funding in many markets to try and alleviate that dependence of value chains. It's happening with gigafactories, it's also going to start happening with critical metals. We will see more government support for reshoring of value chains. Uh, just the last thing to close off today, just talk a little bit about the, the copper market, always a commodity analyst favourite. Uh, we do think this is a market that there's no other way about it has to uh, th start thinking about substitution and that affects how we start to think about longer term pricing. Um, there's no way to balance the copper market without taking some substitution of aluminium through. The extent to which that will be needed depends a lot on carbon policy and it depends a lot on whether we push towards higher renewables uh, quotas in, in uh, utility structures. But if we look at a simple situation whereby if we're looking for 3.6 times copper to aluminium ratio through the cycle in order to get sufficient um, replacement, well, if we take aluminium a dollar a pound, let's say $2,200 a ton, you're looking at three and a half to $3.6 a pound for copper through the cycle. If I'm a copper producer, I want the biggest carbon tax I can get because, as I noted before, the top end of that aluminium cost curve goes up dramatically. And when that happens, well, the copper substitution price goes up 3.6 times that. And that's where it becomes very interesting for through the cycle pricing. So again, I just want to give you a flavor of how we're maybe changing the way we think about our analytical process, uh, bringing carbon into the equation and some of the interesting dynamics now, but I'll happily take any questions you have in the Q&A. Uh, with that, I'll stop sharing and, and pass back to you, Adam. Fantastic. Thank you, Colin. Excellent. Very interesting uh, points covered there. Okay, uh, moving on. Bernard, I'd like to invite you to uh, share your screen and um, introduce us to your presentation. Okay, thank you. So, yes, as Colin was mentioning, extraordinary year for uh, commodities-based metals. Uh, we saw a 40% increase in prices, up to 40% increase in prices, uh, basically noted on the becoming index. So the big question is, you know, do we see this rally continuing into 2022 on the back of the whole story of the energy transition, et cetera, or uh, do we see a correction as we're already probably starting to see? So my straightforward answer is a short-term correction in prices. And then we head into a gradual increase in prices uh, on a long ter longer term outlook. So what is my rationale here? So I think we mustn't forget what's the basis of the price increase in 2021. I think there are two main reasons. One is that 2021 is actually a bumper year. So we mustn't forget that 2021 is the combination in terms of demand for commodities or demand for any other goods is the combination of 2020 demand plus 2021. So that lockdown deferred a lot of the demand and made 2021 into a bumper year, into this combo year. So going forward into 2022, we think that element of a bumper year uh, should start winning down. That demand of 2020 will be satisfied hopefully by then. 
So that will alleviate uh, the demand uh, pressure and all the supply pressures that we had seen because the economies were operating or the industrials are operating into a just-in-time uh, economy. The second thing I think that we saw, which is transient and which helped increase prices, uh, especially during the month of October, September, has been the China energy crunch. So they had an issue whereby because of that bumper demand that I just mentioned, they needed more energy. At the same time, as part of their uh, lowering their carbon footprint, they put um, if, uh, measures to reduce uh, coal consumption, so including coal mining. So that created, along with some um, drought and some hydro dams, that created kind of a lot of tension in terms of electricity. Uh, whereby coal output just increased by 4%, but electricity consumption increased by around 14%. So they couldn't keep up. Um, but the government recently took measures which has helped alleviate the crisis. So now pretty much all the provinces are operating back at normal. There are just a few, uh, you can count them on your finger, probably three or four areas that still have some uh, blackout issues. But aside from that, uh, the situation has improved. And also you put it into perspective, um, aluminium consumed 6%, smelters consumed 6% of China's electricity. So they were the first ones to be impacted because in terms of the GDP, the size in terms of the share in GDP of aluminium production is relatively small. So they weren't gonna prioritize aluminium production uh, over the rest of the economy. And that's why they hit hard on the smelters to reduce their uh, smelting capacity so they can deal with that uh, uh, electricity crisis. But as I mentioned, now going forward, it does seem that the electricity crisis is under control. So coal output has now increased to 12 million, I think, uh, over the past month, up from around uh, 9.5 million uh, in, in summer. So going forward, that um, how do you say that caused that contribution to higher commodity prices um, is just transient. It's not going to be there into 2022. So that's two reasons why I think going to 2022, we're going to see uh, prices of commodities, uh, base metals, uh, specifically, sorry, base metals cooling, cooling down. Um, the other thing also to mention also is some of, of some concern is basically just the general Chinese economic slowdown. So what does China equate to in terms of uh, base metals? So just Chinese copper demand itself in, in terms of the industry, of, of the real estate sector, and this is the big issue, is that China with the Evergrande uh, situation is starting to weigh on, uh, their, econ on, on, on their uh, economy. So you look at the tensions with Evergrande and you try and look at the real estate. So what does the real estate contribute, sector contribute to uh, demand for commodities? So you look at those charts, each one of them, you look at the construction sector and when it comes to copper is around 11.2% uh, of global world demand. Uh, you look at aluminum, that's 14.5%. Uh, and you look at actually steel and uh, we're at uh, just over 40% of global demand, 41% um, of global demand for steel is just the construction sector. Uh, part of it is the real estate sector uh, in China. So that story about Evergrande uh, is creating tension in the market and it's partially contributing um, to lower uh, optimism when it comes to base metals. So you look at the Chinese market sentiment, when you look at the Evergrande, you know, it's negative 0 0.4. That being is, and the real estate market is kind of just under uh, zero. You look at Chinese property developers, you know, in terms of negative sentiment, it's up to like 30%, which is substantial. And finally, and importantly also, and that's the differentiation here, is that you look at privately owned development in terms of the high yield ones, they reach at around 13% in terms of the yield, but the state owned and the investment grade yields haven't changed much. So going forward, our view is that this real estate crisis will be contained. It will be 
mainly impacting the high yield um, real estate uh, sector and not the privately owned or um, privately owned, if you want, safe investment grade or the state owned developments. But generally speaking, when it comes to um, China, our outlook for the next few months are not very positive. So that all leads us to uh, think that you know commodity prices, be it for uh, aluminium, could drop to around 2,200 by the start of next year per ton, uh, copper by to around 8,800, uh, and nickel to around 18,000. But moving forward after Q1 2022, we think we're going to go back into a gradual, slower paced increase in uh, commodity based metal prices. And why is that? We think that actually we're buyers of the commodity super cycle, the, the, the commodity energy transition super cycle. So if you look at what happened over the past few years, is that there's been severe underinvestment from the miners. And what it takes for a super cycle is underinvestment. Uh, from the suppliers, from the miners, plus stimulus coming from some government, some from government. So just looking at uh, the capex, they slashed capex from around 110 billion to around 40, 45 billion in 2016, and since then that capex has just gradually increased. We're not back to the levels that we saw. And what does that mean? So when a miner stops uh, investing in long-term capex. It takes around five years, uh, stop investment or starts investing in, in capex. It takes around five years to see an impact. So if he stopped investing, you're probably going to see that in five years time, his output is going to drop. And if he just started investing, it's probably going to take five years to see the output increase. So generally speaking, what this chart is telling us is that going forwards, this underinvestment that we've seen since 2016 in capex means that the supply is going to be constrained. At the same time, we talk about the Biden infrastructure plan, we talk about the European Green Deal, we talk about uh, the Chinese measures put in place uh, to reduce pollution and the, elect uh, and the electric vehicle uh, revolution. And you see there is going to be a big imbalance uh, between what supply can offer and what demand uh, is asking. So I've got two just examples here before I finish just copper and what I did on this left hand chart is to lag to do to do that five year lag that I was explaining on miners and you'll see that you know copper growth in 2019 2020 is set to start dropping probably in 2021 and going forwards into 2022 and 23 probably for this year you know in the, in the near term uh, we'll still see some of the output growing as the miners get excited about the higher uh, prices and start aiming for more expensive areas surrounding the mine. But going forward, uh, that underinvestment in CapEx, as the chart shows, probably means that their output will at best, uh, in terms of primary output, will at best be flat, but we'd expect it to drop. And the second thing, if you look at nickel, you know, you look at primary nickel demand, um, you look at a sulfide mine output, which goes into the electric vehicle batteries. And again, here, there's been severe underinvestment. Uh, much of the investment in uh, nickel had gone into uh, laterites, into nickel big iron at the expense of nickel sulfide. But what batteries need is, is high grade nickel, category one uh, sulfide nickel. And we haven't seen much investment in there. And even if they started kicking off now, uh, those massive investments, it would take five years for that to arrive. And then the second thing, yes, we've all heard about Xinjiang being able to upgrade into mat and into battery grade nickel, but that comes at a very heavy carbon footprint and at a high uh, price. So generally speaking, we are uh, bullish uh, uh, on uh, base metals, but we'd expect to see a correction continuing to take place between now and the first quarter of uh, next year. And that's about it from my side. Um, I'll hand over back to uh, Adam. Very good. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, we'll delve into some of the points raised in a little bit, but I'd like to quickly turn over to Michael, who's uh, joining us now. Michael, over to you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, so let's see whether I can tell you 
something new after uh, the uh, esteemed speakers uh, before us. So in terms of uh, in terms of presentation and, and layout, I thought I'd say a little bit uh, something about uh, the uh, current proceedings uh, at the uh, at the COP summit, then focus uh, shortly on aluminum, and then look at the uh, at the business cycle, the business cycle stage, where we're in right now, and how we have effectively been deteriorating uh, uh, of late. But firstly, uh, on the uh, on the COP summit, I think. The reason why, why, why I thought uh, it is important uh, to focus about the COP summit and net zero is that we've had previous occasions where governments were pushing a, um, a strong agenda and uh, ultimately uh, ran into, not headwinds, but some challenges. And I think the one um, method that I would highlight in that regard is palladium, uh, for instance. Um, so the government, the European Union, when you're looking through the critical raw materials report, they highlighted in uh, in recent years, uh, well, almost two decades ago, that uh, palladium supply is a little bit tight, but they um, were very concentrated. They tightened emission standards um, uh, nonetheless, and as a result, uh, palladium rallied by 1,500% uh, over the uh, following period of time. I think right now when we're talking about the metals market, a lot of times uh, it feels uh, a little bit the same in that we're discussing uh, whether uh, EV penetration is going to be 30% by uh, 2030, uh, or whether it's going to be 20% uh, or even uh, or even 40. So what we did is we basically uh, looked at uh, all of those uh, technologies that we uh, th that are out there at the moment to help uh, tackle uh, climate change. We looked at not all of the metals uh, in here. That you require uh, to build those technologies, but uh, we focused on uh, on a few uh, important ones that are also uh, interesting uh, to the uh, to the audience. And then we basically looked at net zero, right? Everyone talks about net zero uh, at the moment and how we need to achieve it uh, by uh, by 2050. Focus clearly uh, is on the COP summit uh, uh, here at the moment, and again. A lot of times, uh, the focus is really on the outcome uh, from the COP, uh, COP summit. So we meet new and more ambitious uh, pledges. That's true. I think uh, when you're looking at the pledges that we've had so far, uh, they won't take us uh, to net zero by 2050. We need to solve the uh, climate financing issue. That is, um, it is uh, climate change is expensive, as we've just, or tackling climate change, change is ex ex expensive, as we've just found out on the aluminum side. And then I think the third thing is we need to uh, finalize uh, some of the uh, some of the rule book. The interesting bit then is when you're uh, looking at what net zero uh, actually means in 2050. The IEA had a very neat uh, scenario uh, analysis out on that, and they effectively looked at uh, how much investment you need to see in all of those uh, technologies. That you require uh, to decarbonize the global economy. Between now and uh, 2030, when you're looking at renewables, you need to install four times more renewable. You need to increase uh, EV sales by a factor of uh, of 18. And just to put those uh, the latter number into context, if you wanted to have net zero by 2050, that means uh, that you should really have an uh, an EV uh, uh, or a penetration of electrified vehicles in new car sales of over 60% uh, by 2030. So quite a uh, so quite a an ambitious target. Uh, let's put it uh, let's put it this way. And so what I'm what we are missing a little bit in the discussion is how are you going to finance all of it? How do you make sure that you're actually not running out of uh, that you're not running out of commodities uh, along uh, along the line? And again. Putting some of those numbers into context, take, take the lithium market. For instance, lithium supply last year is 300,000 tons. If you want to have net zero by 2050, those 300,000 tons of supply that we had last year will meet demand of 3 million tons by 2030 and demands of 5 million tons by uh, 2050. So I think um, we need to strap on our boots to make sure that we actually have all of that metal uh, out there. You can also look at that in terms of, uh, of CapEx. So when you're looking at uh, at industry uh, capex, say over the last decade, and let's call this a, a steady state uh, capex. I think the industry, uh, in aggregate, uh, China, world outside China, on average, spend uh, just under hundred billion dollars uh, uh, annually. 
And I, I say it's a steady state investment because there was a little bit of a focus on uh, on decarbonization and tackling climate change, but really it was, uh, particularly 10 years ago, still relatively uh, relatively small uh, focus, uh, I would argue. So when you're now looking then uh, towards uh, net zero and uh, 20, uh, 2030 alone, uh, beyond that steady state spending of, uh, of $99.5 billion, the miners actually need to spend uh, just under $80 billion annually on commodities that you require uh, for the decarbonization sector, so renewable EVs and energy storage to make sure that we actually have enough metal. And the, uh, uh, Colin and Bernard mentioned it already. I think that that money just hasn't come, uh, that money hasn't just come through. And so um, I think there needs to be an honest discussion at some stage as well on how we're actually going to make sure that we uh, have actually all the commodities, the mined commodities that we require um, to facilitate uh, a tackling of climate change. Recycling certainly plays into that substitution to some extent, but uh, look, I mean, this year, everything, or last 18 months, everything has rallied. Aluminum has rallied and copper has rallied. So what you gain from substituting from one structure, one structure of wool market into potentially another structure of wool market, really not, uh, really not that much. Um, so that I think is going to become more of a focus uh, over the, uh, over the coming, uh, over the coming years. And I think the one commodity where we do see how expensive uh, tackling climate change uh, really is, is, uh, is aluminum, right? I think we have got a capacity cap in China. When you're looking at the world outside China, we still don't have an awful lot of investment uh, going into the industry. And so we effectively have got the market moving the deficits. That's the uh, uh, chart on the top left-hand side. And in China, um, the, the chart on the bottom is a uh, shows the capacity utilization rates. If you um, have rising capacity utilization rates, in a processing industry, that always means one thing, higher pricing power to the producers. And if you hit uh, smelting capacity in China of plus 90%, potentially over the coming years, that I think means that, uh, well, uh, prices potentially will have to go up. The question is beyond China, right, where the government uh, uh, in, uh, has asked uh, the, the, the aluminum industry not to invest uh, that much. The question really is why is no one in the West um, uh, spending uh, at the moment. I think one of the issues is the uh, operating and the financing environment, right? You build a smelter potentially to run for the next 50 years or 100 years, um, if you're lucky. Um, but you don't even know how, say, the carbon environment uh, looks like uh, in the next 18 months. You don't know if you're a Middle Eastern smelter, whether you can uh, ship your material easily to Europe uh, further, down, uh, further down the line. Beyond that, and this is what this chart shows, I think if you look at incentive prices uh, in the aluminum industry. Previously, in previous years, we could have justified building an aluminum smelter at around $2,100 per ton, roughly, minimum. But now you're only building an aluminum smelter, particularly in the West, if you have actually access uh, to, renewable, uh, to renewable power. And a lot of times that means that you potentially have to build uh, that renewable power. And that, it's, it's, it's easy, it's relatively uh, cheap to run renewables, but it's relatively expensive in terms of capex to build it out. And so you're basically adding a minimum $500 per ton uh, to that incentive price. And so the industry, I think, sustainably needs around uh, $2,600 to $2,100 per ton to actually pull the trigger on a smelting capacity. And we've only just gotten there. And that's, I think, why the project pipeline X China continues to remain um, relatively, uh, relatively empty. So I think um, there's a lot of uh, pressure points at the moment, I think, uh, building up in the uh, in the metal industry. I think the more aggressive uh, we are pushing for the necessary measures to reduce uh, emissions and tackling climate change, the more the focus will be on the mining industry, I think, going forward to facilitate uh, all of those metals units or to bring forward all of those metals units that we do need. That said, look, I think, and this is just, we can talk a lot about the, the business cycle. A lot of, a lot of the the issues that we do see uh, globally right at the moment are to some extent not the box standard global uh, slowdown story that normally comes through, right? There's not really like the excess capacity that has been built up uh, that leads to a uh, to slow down economic activity. What we do see is property in China having an issue, autos having an issue to some extent. But we do to some extent also see that post-COVID rebound uh, actually slowing. And I think this is what uh, that chart shows. Basically, from the during the last 12 months or so, we have gone 
through the recovery into expansion and now pretty much into the downturn uh, downturn phase. And that chart, the chart on the left-hand side that shows you uh, uh, is a reflection of industrial activity. And the bottom line is uh, once you're starting to move into downturn and recession phases, it starts getting a little bit more difficult to see uh, sustained uh, price increases. And so I think we've had um, an extremely bullish period uh, over the last 12 to 18 months, but it may turn out that the coming 12 months are not quite as uh, bullish, especially for a metal like uh, for metal like copper. Look, I leave it at that. Um, hand it back to you, uh, Adam. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Michael. Excellent. And thanks everyone for presenting. That's uh, really good. We ran a little, little over time, but that's fine. Uh, we've covered some great stuff already. So pretty bullish, but uh, everything um, slightly um, less bullish looking into next year, depending on the commodities that we focus on. Everyone's covered this from different angles, and it's covered off a lot of the questions that I'd had submitted in advance. But there's a few more uh, that I'd collected that I'd like to fire off, and they will be a bit sporadic and random. Uh, but someone's actually written in the live Q&A and I'll remind anyone who uh, viewers, you can still submit through the live Q&A now as well. Um, coming back to some of the China focus uh, that you've all touched on, um, and I think this is pertaining to a point maybe that Colin raised at the beginning. Um, someone's asked, um, with the idea of China offshoring production, does this mean that we should be more focused on Chinese policy as opposed to tracking dry bulk rates, port stocks and production, for instance, or I would have thought there would be a combination of, 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 of all of the above. Um, but I'll leave that over to you guys to call in. Maybe you can... Yeah, um, yeah, getting China policy right is the key thing to any uh, commodity analysis. Um, yeah. we, we call ourselves commodity analysts. We're China policy and China property analysts at any point in time. And I think you've... Uh, uh, you've seen that through the presentations. Uh, to me, this is this is an interesting change in strategy because it did come a little bit out of left field, uh, the carbon neutrality push, but you see where it's coming from. And once President Xi puts his name behind it, it becomes a lot more real. And we are now seeing CISA and China Non-Ferris uh, Industry Association talk actively about offshoring of capacity. It's, it's a little bit cynical, you could argue, in terms of uh, it is offshoring carbon but it, is, it will change uh, raw material dynamics. It means now we're no longer looking at China expansion. If we look in many of these markets, we've looked at look how self-sufficient China is. I think that self-sufficiency calculation now has to start including Chinese overseas assets. The other thing I would say is that, I mean, it's a second order thing. It's, it's across all economies. Scrap is becoming hugely strategic. Scrap is perhaps... Um, the most underappreciated strategic raw material, and that is the one resource that the developed one low carbon resource that the developed world is long of. And we might see that might be the next stage of protectionism. We see, uh, um, I mean, European Commission already has a, a, a petition in place for a ferrous scrap export ban. And this will be an interesting thing. And it, it starts to drive much more circular economy style behavior and much more self-sufficiency. And that, that will be uh, important for, for material markets. I, I do think that, I mean, what we're talking about here, Michael presents some great statistics there on the growth we're seeing in demand on a future basis that in many cases simply can't be met by mine production. So therefore we have to start looking at the, the uh, greater recycling. And with that, I mean, it's therefore something to be embraced by the industry, not something to be fought. Yep, fantastic. Yeah, I think everyone touched on the... Uh, lack of funds and, and the period that we've had that's going to create further tightness um, uh, across the metal sector. Um, any other comments on China? I, I actually had a question myself around um, Chinese capacity for uh, coal, coal fire power stations and sort of uh, reading headlines around um, increasing the increase there as opposed to the rest of the world that seems to be moving away from more decommissioning coal. Um, uh, is there, are there any comments on or analysis of um, uh, on coal there, particularly in a China lens? I would just say, look, I think the uh, the first thing on China, first thing on China, I would say is that um, the discussion that we've had just now on where we're going to get the commodities from to uh, facilitate uh, tackling climate change, I think China has taken a very strategic view indeed on some of those uh, on some of those commodities when you're looking at nickel the investment that china is taking in uh, in indonesia when you're looking at lithium the investment china is taking really globally right uh, in apac pacific rim in uh, in latin america uh, as well 
cobalt similarly, right, in the DRC. So I think um, the Chinese government, uh, in my view, does see where the direction of travel is going and is trying to make sure that they're not going to run out of um, raw materials uh, along the line. Um, one of those side effects, unfortunately, is that uh, for some of the commodities, the West has fallen a little bit uh, behind. Uh, it's certainly not prudent, as, we, as we've just seen, to rely to almost 90% uh, on supply uh, from one country, where when you have got a power issue, you effectively run short of, uh, of that uh, material, uh, magnesium, uh, magnesium, that is. On the coal side, look, did that see, that's the other thing. I think the... Um, the, the, question, uh, the question is about how do you execute uh, tackling climate change uh, effectively? And I mentioned before, I, think, I, I just think it's, it's very expensive to do climate change. In, in, in a way, one of, the, one of the issues that we've had this year in China, one of the issues that we have had in, in the UK and so Europe uh, as well, is that the renewable generation has just been uh, very, very uh, um, comparatively uh, uh, disappointing. Let's put it. Uh, let's put it this way. And that takes me back to the energy storage. I think you just didn't have the energy storage potentially in, in, in place that helps you with those uh, intermittency uh, with those intermittency issues. So I think there's an awful lot, lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that you have a cohesive and coherent infrastructure in place uh, going forward. Now, as all of that happens, can you do? Uh, can you help? Oh, can you rely? Do you need to rely on some of the traditional uh, technologies? Probably, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't face them out uh, ultimately. But I think every country is looking at. Well, hopefully we go, we're getting through the winter, okay? But every country is looking at the last few months and then the winter, and probably does not want to get back to uh, where, we, where we were uh, where we were before. China, look, they said that they're not going to build any uh, any coal fire plant uh, uh, abroad, which is. Um, I think um, uh, worth noting. Um, at the same time, look, yes, I see that they uh, that they pursue it still uh, domestic. I think energy security and safety, uh, as such, probably also remains a, a factor here for now. Yeah. Uh, just on the yeah, please, Bernard. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to tie up on a point that Michael is talking about, which which I think is very interesting. Is this whole strategic uh, point about securing natural resources and uh, commodities for China and how clearly they've secured the lion's share in terms of uh, uh, the, the metals. And what does that mean for the electric vehicle uh, revolution? They're pushing for lithium iron. Uh, but what that has created outside of China, actually, if you look at Europe, is they are conscious, they are conscious about China having secured pretty much all of the natural resources outside of in the world, pretty much, let's, let's call it that way, in Indonesia and in Africa, etc. And what can Europe do? So they've created the Battery Council, uh, basically trying to promote mm. um, the creation of batteries in China, in in Europe, as opposed to just relying in China. But what they've, what they're really trying to push is actually hydrogen. So in a way, if if it's much more expensive to produce on hydrogen, hydrogen right now is not. Um, as cost efficient if you, if, if you had a fuel cell vehicle running on hydrogen as opposed to an electric vehicle running on, on lithium ion battery. But what the Europeans are really trying to push, what the funding is going towards is, is hydrogen for Europe. You even see it in the UK, you could say it's a bit ridiculous. We're converting hydrogen gas into hydrogen to then heat houses. Why not just send the gas directly to the houses, etc. But clearly the solution, it seems, for some of the European countries is going through the hydrogen route to get gain some independence mm -hmm. from the need for those base metal uh, uh, commodities. And the other point I'd, I'd like to make actually is when it comes to China and when it comes to a lot of uh, countries, it's great when you've got an economic cycle and everything's going uh, very well, then you start clamping down on pollution. But once you get a financial crisis like we just got you start seeing some uh you know taking more lax measures when it comes to emissions uh just because you know lower carbon emissions tend to be more expensive to run your economy on than uh if you're much more uh, much, much more strict 
you know, China produces in terms of coal, I think 60% of their electricity or 65% of their electricity is on, on, on coal, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. So running your electric vehicles on that isn't great. It's not the same as saying Norway, which is overwhelmingly running their electricity on hydro. Um, it's, it's, it's a very different uh, calculation. Um, Okay, excellent. Um, uh, just drawing on some of your points there, particularly um, on the energy uh, security theme, um, I've had a couple of questions of other metals and I'll tie them in with our discussion. Uh, uranium uh, was one that we had a few questions about and I don't think anyone touched on. Um, it's unique in the sense that, um, you know, it, it's touted as a clean, cleaner or cleanest energy source. And actually at the summit, um, I read a headline around uh, Rolls-Royce winning a tender for some small scale nuclear um, uh, power plant developments in the UK. Obviously countries are fragmented with their response on it. Germany saying no to nuclear, France is very heavily dependent on it. Um, does anyone have a view on uh, just the outlook for uranium and whether we're gonna see governments or, 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 or industries shifting more to nuclear given its cleaner credentials? It's, it's an interesting uh, market, Adam, and there's one that's, uh, I mean, I like to say commodity markets self-solve, they never have prolonged period of supply and demand imbalance, but there's always exceptions, and uranium has been that exception over much of the past decade. We've built a lot of inventory, and we're still working our way through it, but what we have now is, uh, I mean, a very unusual situation where the, the largest producers have been until recently the very largest buyers in the in the spot market. There's absolutely no doubt that the longer term potential is there. It can form a low carbon baseload of many economies. And, and what you mentioned there, the small modular reactors, they really could be the game changer. What we're looking at then is is much more um, much more flexibility in utility systems or in baseload and almost moving the uh, the actual generation back towards the, the the main population basis. Also needs a lot less cooling water. So very important from that regard. Um, yeah, you do have countries like Germany that are pushing away, but they've, they've adopted more a quantum leap strategy rather than a transition. And I think that's starting to, to, become, a, to become a little bit clearer. Look, I do think it's a situation where um, we will see um, uh, it's one commodity where we haven't seen the China demand push yet. And that's still the key thing here. Uh, China's got the target of um, up to 120 gigawatts of, of nuclear power. By 2030, that's a huge boost. And with that, um, I would expect to see a situation where China will be pulling into these markets. Now, the first thing is we can bring back um, uh, we can bring back idle capacity, but then we have to start to look to new supply. But that probably is a end of the decade, maybe even to into 2030s type of scenario. Excellent. Um, any other comments on uh, uranium? Or we can move on. I've got quite a few few bits to get through. Um, let's, let's go on to PGMs because we talked about hydrogen fuel cells and we talked about um, uh, the long-term view, perhaps beyond EVs, the European push towards hydrogen. What's the impact there for the demand upside on PGMs? Obviously, I see use it being in decline is hurting uh, some uh, PGMs in the long run, but would hydrogen fuel cell vehicles rebalance that uh, demand? <clears throat> Yeah, I think my, my personal opinion on hydrogen fuel cells when it comes to cars is, you know, I, I wouldn't be betting. You know, it's it's going to take a while uh, to see them on the road, to see them being competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think hydrogen fuel cells in terms of a solution for decarbonization is probably on the heavy, heavy, heavy trucks, uh, trains. Uh, when it comes to your normal passenger cars, uh, you know, electricity is pretty much everywhere in every, every single corner. You know, in London, you can even recharge your car on a lamppost. Um, you could do that in a countryside, etc. You, you've got systems whereby you can sell your electricity back to, to your neighbor. He can charge at your house, etc. Et so the problem with, with hydrogen is it's, it's a big problem in terms of the infrastructure. In France, you currently have only three, I think, stations. Mm -hmm. And a hydrogen car has a range of, uh, the Mirai has a range of like 400 kilometers. In Germany, I think you have 16, I think, hydrogen sessions. It, it's not, we're still far compared to the lithium ion vehicles. So in terms of the impact on PGMs for the next three, four, five years, I, I don't think it's going to be uh, important. The other problem, I guess, with hydrogen is the conversion. So if you're converting, taking electricity from a wind farm, and uh, sending that electricity towards your car yes. in terms of energy loss, you probably lose 
than 10%. Uh, so your car is going to be using probably around 85% of that energy. With a hydrogen car, if you're using the same thing with a hydrogen fuel cell, um, you've got to compress the gas, you've got to do the electrolysis, you're going to lose, 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 lose energy. You're only going to end up with 35% of that energy that you started off with. So it's extremely inefficient in that sense. So until we get nuclear fusion or something of the sort, um, there are other ways, I'm asking for the nuclear fusion, but it's something on the tables, but it, it does seem it doesn't look like it's for the next five years when it comes to these things. Yeah, certainly the base load energy source is uh, critical for that. Um, any other thoughts on PGMs, Michael? Yeah, look, I think it's, it takes it back to uh, to uh, creating or gener- making a uh, an integrated um, system from uh, renewables uh, generation to energy storage and then uh, through the fuel cell and um, uh, electric vehicles or the fuel cell uh, electric uh, electric vehicles. I do I, I do agree. I think the um, the biggest um, the biggest demand growth is not going to come through from uh, from passenger cars, but it is uh, going to come through uh, the, uh, the buses and the uh, and the trucks. But ultimately, I think if you want to uh, if you want to decarbonize uh, commercial vehicles uh, as well. Certainly, you can make a case uh, for hydrogen uh, playing a large role in that. And we do see that, for instance, in uh, some of the miners, like take uh, take Amplatz, for instance, with Platinum, right? Uh, they do have, they do actually have kind of uh, the start uh, of a of an integrated uh, infrastructure from solar panels to hydrogen generation to uh, um, to fuel cell trucks uh, in the uh, in the mine. I think that's exactly uh, what you're uh, what you're going to need. So I think in terms of uh, in terms of demand uh, demand growth integrated. I think coming back to the net zero scenarios, we have uh, about 2.5 uh, million ounces of demand uh, for platinum potentially uh, from um, from hydrogen electrolysis and um, and fuel cell electric vehicles, which should go some way offsetting uh, some of the demand losses that you potentially have because you're putting less ice vehicles on the road. On the palladium side, unfortunately, well, if you put less, uh, if you rely to 90% on, uh, on uh, cars with a uh, combustion engine in your demand uh, and you're taking ice cars off the road, it gets really tricky, I think. And I think from a palladium angle, it's very hard to find a uh, find a bullish narrative, I think, uh, going, uh, going forward. There's, so there may well be a, kind of a, um, a reversal in trends, platinum stronger versus palladium weaker compared to what we've seen in the past uh, few years. Yeah, interesting. Okay, we're sort of on the hour, but we did start a bit late. So if everyone's okay, I just want to rattle through one, one more unless everyone has to go. Um, uh, we've, I've just had a couple come in. Um, someone's asked about iron ore price at the end of Q1. Um, are we going to see, um, this bullish, uh, iron ore prices? Well, I think, uh, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, gents, if you want to give a view there. I'll, I'll start off. I mean, the iron ore market, um, obviously, no, iron ore is a phenomenally efficient commodity and, uh, price has to allocate resource very quickly. Uh, what we've seen is see this cut to Chinese steel output has been phenomenal. And we still get the iron ore market adjusting to it. We still, I mean, the fact that port inventories are rising tells you we haven't rationalized enough demand yet. Now, what's interesting, there's a natural seasonality to iron ore. Normally, you expect Chinese steel production to start ramping back up again in the new year. That will be delayed a little bit by the Winter Olympics, but we do still see it happening. Um, I think if we start to see a few more property supportive measures, we could be at the bottom of the, getting to the bottom of the iron ore market. Uh, but well, let's be clear, we're not going back to $200 a ton anytime soon. Uh, we are looking more at 120 for the first quarter, but then we do have it, I mean, reverting back below 100 beyond that. I would agree with that. I think it does look, um, it does, it, the, the issue that you do have is that you have got a convergence a little bit between uh, arm or growth from the global steel industry and arm or exports one way or another from Brazil and Australia when you, when you take them combined. And I think that combination is <clears throat> just not particularly healthy. So you potentially have a rebound <clears throat> as the steel industry just normalizes. But beyond that, it feels to me like you're going back to the pre-COVID, pre-Vale uh, uh, situation where you, where, you, where you effectively traded flattish uh, for quite a few quarters 
at the uh, tail end of the uh, of the cost curve. I think it becomes a marginal cost commodity again uh, unless something happens on uh, on the supply side. And I think that doesn't seem we could all we can always have accidents. But from what we gather from the big producers, I think uh, asking them about uh, value over volume, I think uh, some of them do say already now, look, we produce what we produce. Um, and uh, it's not us who have to cut, it's um, some of the higher cost producers that will have to cut. So it feels a more challenged uh, market certainly uh, going forward than it, uh, than it has been. Yeah, in terms of cash cost of productions of iron ore, I mean, it's one of the metals where probably um, the margins they're currently making are humongous. Um, so even if prices drop to 90 or 80, they're still pretty much a lot producing uh, at those, those, those price levels. And also, again, like, yeah, probably prices below 100 into next year on the back of also that, that you know, again, the point we we're talking about 2021 being a bumper year. And we're not going to see that phenomenal demand that we saw um, this year. You know, Chinese steel production probably reached the record of a of a. It's we've in terms of uh, Chinese steel production, we've probably reached the peak Chinese uh, uh, production, historic production. The next country in line to be a big steel producer is probably going to be be India, but in terms of growth of steel output, I don't think over the next few years is going to come from uh, from China. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Look, I'm conscious we're keeping everyone, uh, but I do, uh, this is the last Commodities Outlook webinar we'll do for this year. Um, so if I could just ask everyone very quickly for, you know, we've got the notion that there's going to be some cooling off, not going to have as big a bull market going into next year, but who might, what, what commodity might, or what metal might be uh, the standout performer. Um, do you have a hot pick? Um, could it be precious metals shooting back up again with the amount of inflation that we've been experiencing? Um, could it be uh, a, a niche metal or even lithium continuing to push to higher prices? Does anyone, would, 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 let's go around the panel and just get your hot pick for 2022 crystal ball moment. If I can start actually quickly on the, uh, just on, on, on my last comment, I think the the rebound trade from all the issues that we have in the auto industry, to me, is uh, platinum. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bernard, do you have your shot? Yeah, from my side, pretty, pretty much bearish on pretty much uh, everything. I would agree with uh, Michael that uh, you know that we should be expecting to see a rebound in automobile sales once automobile production, if I may say, uh, with PGMs probably benefiting. Uh, the most, but I wouldn't be terribly excited about uh, those prices. It's, it's not going to be a massive rally. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Colin, just wrap us okay. up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's tricky to pick that long quote considering where we're coming from. I mean, I would be looking at actually the cobalt was a catch up trade in the battery raw materials. It does look like China's raw material inventory is getting a little bit low there. Um, aside from that, some of these niche metals I think will become uh, more interesting as, uh, as um, uh, 2022 progresses. Uh, I do think you're going to see a lot more, uh, as I say, critical metals protection, and that could see a performance. Things like gallium, some of these smaller commodities, I think, will will perform well. The big ones, uh, it's going to be tricky to, I mean, come off the back of the demand impulse we've seen this year. Uh, it's, to me, it's more about sustaining profitability rather than necessarily uh, uh, pushing commodity prices higher. Yep. Okay, excellent. Fair enough. Uh, well, gentlemen, we're at past the hour. Thank you very much for sticking on and for making that a very interesting session covering a lot um, in a very relatively short period of time. Uh, thanks for your contributions today and this year. Um, and for, for viewers, uh, just one final push that if you want this content, a replay will be available on the assay um, on our website. Check that out. Um, and also uh, various other mining investment insights and, and uh, quality outlooks um, also on that platform. So thanks very much for tuning in, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.